Reality, Relationships, and the Red Pill, with Paul Elam and Tom Golden. Episode 2, Family of Origin Number 2, Know Thyself. Let's see what they're up to. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Paul Elam with a voice for men and an ear for men. And I am sitting, as I am wont to do at times, uh, across the internet from my good friend, Mr. Tom Golden of menaregood.com. Hi, Tom. How you doing, bud? Paul, I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, what is it you like to say? I feel better all over than anywhere else. Yeah, uh, something right. like that. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, that's we good. Were, we were talking last time that we did one of these Hangouts. Or I guess since we're not on Google, we can not call this a Hangout. We can say it's something else. And screw Google. Google. Um, <laughs> we were talking about family of origin issues. Mm-hmm. And what we talked about was a sort of an overview of family systems, how that worked. We equated that to John Bradshaw's work describing the family sort of as a mobile and that the parts were individuals, but they were not totally interdependent, that, that they, if you touch one part of a mobile, the other parts move. That's what happens in families. When one person is affected, everybody's affected. The, that it results in roles that people perform in order to keep the, the family in a sense of balance, that the family itself as a unit is seeking balance and all the individuals in it are seeking balance and balance with each other. And sometimes, um, matter of fact, all the time in that pursuit, people adopt roles. And the roles can be the hero child, the scapegoat, the mascot, the lost child. Uh, Some people assert there's other roles, but I won't get into all that. Um, And we talked about how those roles affect you in terms of your individuality, that uh, the downside of roles, and there's a few upsides for some people, but the downside is that you don't get to find out who you are outside the role. I mean, you've got a role to fill for the family. If you're the family hero, the football star, the captain of the football team, the great athlete that makes straight A's and is going to get the scholarship to Harvard and gives this family this great sense of decency, well, that's one kid that better not ever get arrested, I'll tell you that, or get into any kind of a brush with the law or skip school or get in trouble or act out in any way because that is certainly not within their role. Um and it does. It sort of takes away from who you would find out who you would be. Yes. Pressure from the family. Yes. The roles can have a habit of locking us into a certain way of being that we get locked into this way. And it comes out not just in our family, but at work and at play and at all kinds of places. So it's like these roles can inhibit us from being who we are, you know. And they can be quite quite destructive. You know, oh, some boy. people, I would say, in the scapegoat role can act out all the way to prison. And they do uh, uh, end up in serious trouble with the law and with a lot of anger that they don't understand. Because the thing about the family doesn't communicate real issues with each other. And people are walking around simmering underneath the surface and they don't know why. And having to live life in in one of these roles prevents you from exploring why. And we covered all that, I think, pretty well, but what we didn't talk about, and I was hoping we could get into some tonight, was that these roles, when you turn 18 and go off to college, or you turn 21, go into the military, whatever you do, the role doesn't just go away because you left your family. Right. And so maybe you can talk for a minute or so about that, Tom, about the fact that, you know, you carry this like baggage for for life. That's exactly right. You know, you do carry it like baggage. And the problem is you don't know you're carrying it. It's basically invisible to you because, it, you know, the one way to look at it is that our families are like cultures. You know, it's like we grow up in a certain family and it's like that's a culture. It's like, oh, we're growing up in an Italian culture. You know, things are this way because that's the way they're done. And everyone Everyone has a family that's a different culture, you know, and it's just, it's, it's varied completely. And when you get then a man and a woman together in a relationship, guess what happens? You've got two different cultures that are starting to clash and collide. Kaboom. You know, or when you're at work 
And, you know, your boss is a certain way and expects a certain thing of you. And that's not the way you think it should be done. Boom, you have a collision. So, you know, these roles will tend to um, create a, a, a position that's very difficult for us. We don't even know that that's going on. It's like this is we're unaware of everything. So the first thing we need to do is to name it. You know, is to put a name on the damn thing. Because if you don't name it, you can't hold it. You can't, you can't get a grip on it. You know, so we need to be able to look back at what happened to us when we were growing up and to see what happened and go, oh, that's what happened to me. No shit. You know, now I get it, you know. And then once we have a name for it and we can kind of hold it in our hand, then we are able to let it go. Because you can't let go of something you're not holding. You have to hold on to it first before you can let that sucker go. And so... You know, the, the work for us is to be able to find a way to look back at our upbringing in a clear way, in a way that is detached and be able to see it for what it is. Because it's very, very difficult to do this. And it's harder for men to do it than it is for women to do it. And let's call a spade a spade, because what you're talking about here is that we need to be able in our families, or in, in terms of looking back at our families, we need to be able to look back and identify abuse. Yes. And how do you know something's abusive? That's a great question. Why don't we explore that for a minute? Uh, I mean, it's not certainly not abusive just because you didn't like it or yeah. just because it yeah. didn't feel good. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and of course, in nowadays, and I'm not going to poke fun at millennials, <laughs> but oh, it's ahead. almost tempting. Uh, <laughs> there's a, we have, you know, uh, I, I think it's between millennials and the next generation. We have a lot of snowflakes out there that, that feel like anything that feels bad is abuse. Right. And you know what? If it felt bad as a child, it might have been. Uh, I mean, you can't yes. discount that possibility. That is correct. Um, some forms of abuse are very, very plain to see physical abuse. Yeah. I mean, if your parents way of handling your misbehavior was to beat you as a child, we know that's abusive. There's no doubt about that being abusive. Right. And I know that, you know, I've run into plenty of people that say, Oh, that's bullshit, Paul. You know, you can't coddle kids. You know, you need to get that belt out. And no, you don't. You, no. need, you need to grow up and be the adult and know how to handle children uh, because there's a big difference. You know, I understand giving a child a little pop on the bottom when they've wandered out into the street where there's traffic. But there's a huge difference between a pop on the bottom that's for their good and a pop on the bottom that's for your good because yes. you're frustrated, because and you don't know how to manage their behavior. How do you tell the two apart? You know, one of the things that I've found really helpful is to look at the behavior and see if it's attacking your identity. You know, because anytime you're attacking someone's identity, that's probably more abusive. If they're trying to give right you a way message about not going in the street, that's something else again. But if they're saying you're an asshole for going in the street, that's abuse because it's attacking the identity. It's saying you are bad. There's something wrong with your hide. You know, there's something that you're doing that, you know, you're intrinsically a bad person. You know, there's something, your identity is wrong. You know, and that's where we see abuse clearly. And it's not so clear in a lot of places, but usually that little piece there helps to kind of identify it and say, oh, yeah, well, then what I went through as a child was abusive because my identity was attacked over and over and over again. Absolutely. And, you know, one way that comes across very commonly, even outside the realm of physical abuse, is constant messaging from one or both parents. You're, you're an idiot. You're, you're right. no good. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never right. do anything right. Right. Um, and this abuse. is the parents really projecting their own shortcomings into yes. the child. Yes. About, and, and because it likely happened to them. That was what they were raised with. A hallmark of the analysis, folks, is people treat others as they have been treated. You know, so you can bet on it. Someone who's abusing a child was more than likely abused themselves. So, and it may go back, Tom said, last time we, time we talked, the father, sins of the father visited seven generations down. Yes. 
And you will find going back and going back and going back and going back that it's the same pattern of behavior. Uh, it's the same abuse. I think it's also real important to part of, point, important to point out here too that we're not talking about blaming parents here. And there's certainly, and I and I don't want to overstate that because the, a lot of people will refrain from identifying abuse because they don't want to blame their parents. Um, but what I'm saying here is this is about understanding that on one side of the coin, every parent that we know, for the most part, I mean, there's some crazy sociopaths out there, <laughs> but for the most part, each parent does the best they can with what they know how to do. I mean, it, it, it may suck, but they really do try to be good parents. Even the parent that's telling their child for the 4,000th time that they're never going to amount to anything is a parent that there's afraid that the child isn't going to succeed. And that's the only way that they know how to try to get that message across. So this isn't about blaming them, but this is about the other side of the coin. On one side, they did the best they could. On the other side, the best they could sucked. At yes. And it's not about blaming parents. It's about understanding oneself and understanding what you went through and how that has created a certain way that you do things. And now the opportunity is within you to change it, do something different. You know, that's the good part. Yep. And you may get, well, a lot of people will experience anger at their parents when they go through and do this work. Absolutely. And, and there's no sin. I mean, your parents were angry at you a few times. You can be <laughs> angry at them. It's not a sin. But the point is, too, that ultimately, a product of having worked through this stuff is forgiveness, mm -hmm. is that whatever anger you do experience, you come to a point of forgiveness. You come to understand they had the same experiences as you growing up, sometimes harder, uh, that this is they were set up to be the kind of people that they were. And when yes. you really get some of the anger expressed and you start thinking different ways and saying, you know what, I'm not going to be this person anymore. And I'm not going to accept this kind of treatment right. anymore. Right. Because here's the deal. What you'll do is whatever role you played in your family, you're going to recreate that until you understand what that role is, how it happened, the dysfunction in your family, the abuse that you experienced, you're going to go out there and find people to do to you what your parents did. It'll be a woman, it'll be a boss, it'll be friendships, but you will find a way to repeat this whole dynamic so that you can try to correct it and you won't know that you're doing that. Yes. You know, you can see it in town stuff. You know, the, the women who are uh, beaten, what do they do? They get rid of one guy and they go to the next guy that's going to beat them. And then they go to the next guy. What's happening? They're replaying that old stuff over and over and over again. And then blaming it on someone outside of themselves, which is partly true, but the piece that they're missing is that it's partly their responsibility. And what the, what will happen in that too frequently, and I have seen this happen, is that if they manage to pick a guy that won't hit them, they'll provoke him till he does, <laughs> yeah. or they will get rid of him and go find somebody who will hit them. Yeah. And this is one of the nasty little secrets about male domestic violence on women that people don't want to talk about, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. And of course, men do the same thing. They will yes. find somebody to abuse them. The to way replay mother. the old stuff. I mean, naturally, this is not some sort of um, different, bizarre sort of thing people do. It's what you do naturally. You, know, you want people to replay your own past. And that's the bad news. The good news is you can break out of that pattern. There you said a minute ago, Tom, that... Uh, this was harder for men. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's harder for men for, you know, the biggest reason it's harder for men is first off, no one wants to hear men's pain. You know, nobody wants to hear that shit. And, and uh, if no one's willing to hear your pain, how are you going to work this stuff through? You know, it's very, it's much more difficult, particularly things like shame, you know, shame. We need someone outside of ourselves to say, look, man, that's bullshit. You know you're, you're fine the way you did that. That's okay. And after we hear that about the hundredth time, we start saying, well, maybe that's right. But until then, just the shame inside, it is never going to change without that outside feedback. It's not going to change. 
And so we need people outside. And that's why women, you know, can are more likely to heal from this stuff in some ways, you know? Well, and they, what's people listen to them and, <laughs> and their, their focus for healing is interacting, being with other people. When you interact with other people, you got other people telling you, no, 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 that's not right. You're, you're this way, you're that way, blah, blah, blah. Whereas a man's way of healing is much more active or inactive, solitude, both of those ways keep him from interacting with other people who would be there to say, look, man, you're okay. You know, really, this is okay. That's why it's so critical, Paul, that men get involved in the kinds of things we're doing with Patreon, you know, in your group that meets on Saturdays and in the forum that I'm doing on my Patreon site, because they hear from other men. You know, they hear from other men, other red pill men are there for them, standing shoulder to shoulder, talking about some of this stuff. That's critical. That's amazing what's, what's happening in there. Mm. Um, um, I'm loving it. Uh, the Saturday groups are fantastic. And the yeah. reason, you know, when Tom said this, is, men don't get an audience for their pain because the world doesn't want to hear that shit. He's including the mental health field. Yes, that's right. I, I mean, it's, we're, we're laughing, but it's I mean, this is, this is one of the most disgusting realities I can possibly think of is that if, especially in the area of marriage and family, because what do they do when you have marital problems? You've got two people with dysfunctional family issues that have gotten past their honeymoon, and now they're engaged in a power struggle to see whose rules they're going to live by, and a really good therapist could help them with that. Right. But what do they do? They go in, and the guy gets the, to be the identified problem. I mean... From jump, he might be married to the worst borderline biatch you've ever seen in your life. And 15 minutes into the session, the therapist will be saying, you know, you need to do something about this and, and you need to listen to her. She's telling you and she may be telling you why she slept with your brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she'll still find an ally. That's true. And it's, it's, true. it's just awful. So, yeah, Crazy. that is one really big reason why men wisely avoid therapy. Avoid therapy. I've seen it over and over again, Paul. You know, in fact, I wrote a little two thing on couples therapy, an emergency guide for men, because it talks about these things where men are automatically assumed to be uh, the problem, you know, and the whole thing is gynocentric based. And it's based on helping women. And man, if you're not doing therapy with couples as a two equals, then you're, you're making things worse. And it is, here's another part of the difficult difficulty is that because of the way we punish men for caring all about themselves, having boundaries, having values, having limits with how they're going to be treated or any of this. I mean, this comes, a lot of this comes out of dysfunctional family roles, but it's also cultural misandry and, and what gets expressed in a number of different places. Men psychologically are on average defenseless against this stuff. Yes. When they're confronted with being the identified problem, for instance, by a mental health professional, they don't know how to fight that. They end up saying, you know, they sort of hang their head. They, they've been told all their lives it's their fault. Yes. And, here, and here's a professional just telling them what they pretty much already knew. <laughs> and um, they don't have a structure in their mind in place to know how to defend themselves. Right. And for me, this is what red pill and what family systems work individually can do for somebody. When you identify, a, you, when you trained your mind to be able to identify abuse and to reject it and say, hey, wait a minute, no, I'm not the identified problem here. This is a marriage. We both bring garbage and we both got stuff to sort out. And if we can't do it that way, then I'm not paying you $200 an hour to sit here and blame me just so you can, you know, please her. Men don't know how to say that right. because if they did, Marriage and family therapy would be a very different profession. Well, men are, tra are the problem and that they are supposed to make things happy in the, in the relationship. I mean, it's like that's part of what they provide and protect thing, you know? 
Well, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's it. That's it. So, I mean, guys, be careful of therapy, guys. You know, go in and, and uh, go to three. If you if you got to go to somebody, go in and, and do three sessions one at a time with people and see see if someone you know is able to meet your needs. Paul, you and I did a thing one time on helping men choose a therapist. We should probably put a link in the. Oh, yeah, we should. Sure, we should. Sure. We're both well. We'll, yeah. we'll put a, a, and I'll, a I'll put something in there too. That link to the uh, article about the couples therapy, which I think men would find helpful. And also, I want to stress too, a lot of men, and I would argue most of them, don't have to have a therapist. Right. You know, right. You, if you can have just people, if you can cultivate relationships in your life where you're not just seen as a guy, where you're seen as a human being. And when you tell them, hey, you know, yeah, my father used to get a razor strap out and beat me across the back. For somebody to say, that shit is wrong. You didn't deserve that. Just to have that voice in your life and to be able to learn to give yourself permission to acknowledge that that shit was wrong. Yeah. That you shouldn't have been treated that way. Everything from the razor strap to the undermining of your self-respect and, and your confidence in yourself. And uh, a lot of guys uh, experience uh, inappropriate emotional bonding with their mothers growing up. Bradshaw would have called it emotional incest. And I think he'd be right yeah. that uh, once the marriage goes south or the mother gets rid of the father or he can be living in the same house and they're a million miles apart, she'll turn to one of the male children and turn them into an emotional husband, which is sick. It's awful, but it happens a lot. Yes. Yes. And that too is abuse. Yes. Children are not supposed to be put in the role of adults. They're supposed to be a parentification. Parentification. Yes. And then unfortunately you see that same role would be sought out by him later, you know, in some other situation. So guys, be careful, be on the lookout for this kind of thing, this pattern that repeats itself over and over again. Why do I keep drawing this to myself? You know, is the question that people have over and over again. Why do I keep drawing the same pattern? Well, look inside, see what you can find. Talk to other people around you. Look at your relationship with your parents and compare it to your relationship that you're in as an adult. Yes. Uh, into a marriage or a romantic relationship, for lack of a better word. Find out the similarities because, you know, what I've been telling clients for years is that if you sit down and you make a list of everything that frustrated you and bothered you about the way your parents treated you mm-hmm. as a child, and then make that same list about the things that frustrate and bother you about the woman that you're with and the way she treats you. Many, many times you're going to find some very, very disturbing similarities Yes. in those lists. And that's a product of having grown up in one way and recreating in your life. It's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Yes. And that's the bad news. The good news is you can stop it. You don't have to continue this. You can be free of this crap. And the even better news is that once you're free of that, it is one of the most freeing feelings. I mean, it's it's just, um, it is like waking up to red pill thinking. It's just one of those moments in life when you get that you don't have to be what your family stamped you out to be. You can be whatever you choose. Yes. And when you are, are able to identify forms of abuse from your family of origin, and when you're able to work through that, then ultimately forgive uh, and, and move past. Um, that brings me to something, Tom, mm. uh, that I wanted to ask you about. Some mm. people sometimes find it necessary to get out of their family of origin. Hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one, eh? That is extremely tricky. Yeah, I think the the best I've seen is to be able to stand your ground within your family of origin. You know, stand your ground and stand up for who you are uh, if you can. You know, it gets really tricky when 
I've seen over and over again that uh, the feminist therapists are telling these people, you know, oh, you need to get out of there. They're abusive to you. You need to leave and never go back. Uh, no, you need to go back and deal with it. You need to go back and stand up and say, this is not the way I want things to be. And look, you treated me like this, you know? Now, sometimes, Paul, there is certainly reason to not go back. I mean, if someone's really abusive to you, is horrible, acidic, uh, who knows what. But I'm sure there are situations where it's probably best to just bolt. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, it is. It's one of those things. I think just it, that it can't be decided by a therapist. That that is something that has to be decided by the individual. I know for a fact that there are some people that do go back to their family of origins, and when the abuse comes up, they stand up for themselves over and over again. And it's World War Three every time they stand up. And I, I mean, I'm talking for year after year as adults. Yes. Yes. And to the point that there's this horrible, terribly strained relationship that's yes. not getting any better. Yes. Um, so while I've never suggested to anyone to defu as it was, because I, I just think it's irresponsible to make that suggestion, um, I have seen people do it, and I understand it. Yes, I agree. But it's agree. rare. There are situations where it's necessary. And, you know, the person who goes and each time they get crap needs to say, okay, that's all I can take. Maybe I'll see you next year, you know, <laughs> bye. And um, so be it. But deal with it, though. Go and tell them, I'm not going to be around you. You're, you're, what you're doing to me is abusive. I'm not going to take this crap anymore. If you want me to be around, you have to do this, this, and this, you know. So and I will tired. still maintain that even in those cases and – and, and I feel free to disagree. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. I still believe fully that it is very, very difficult to fully heal from that until you've forgiven them. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And, and forgiveness actually comes from the healing of it. I mean, when we can truly understand, the forgiveness kind of flows in. You know, it's not like we have to try and be forgiving. It's like, you know, that's, a, that's going to be a fail every time. But when you really do the work and when you really understand and when you really can accept yourself for who you are, forgiveness just kind of appears. And, man, that's a nice feeling, you know. Yeah, I'm not talking about forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, we don't want to – forgetting is not uh, it's not helpful sometimes, you know. We want to well, remember. Well, you do have to remember, and you have yes. to remember it well enough to make sure that you don't tolerate abuse from yes. them or from other people that's similar. But I do maintain that it is very, very difficult to make that final break from family of origin abuse and from yes. the role and from all that stuff. In, because you're right, it's an it's an it's for you. It's not the abuse. The forgiveness is not for them. Yes, exactly. Precisely, it's for you, and it happens so, inside you. Absolutely, and it doesn't mean helpful. that you have to go loan them money. Or <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that keeps in my mind about what we're talking about now is the PAS. You know, the parental alienation stuff, which we see all the time, and it is so heartbreaking. You know, that, that children are allowed to be brainwashed to such an extent that they shun the, the parent. Ugh. I mean, that's exactly the opposite of what we're talking about. Yes. You know, not working it out. That's, that's, that's turning someone into the bad guy. That's, that's scapegoating, really, in, a, in its essence. So bless all the fathers out there who are, have been alienated from their children. You know, it's a very, very difficult spot. It's terrible. Yeah. Oh, my heart's with you. For them, for the children. And for the kids, too. Yes. Gracious uh, goodness. What a yeah. loss for them. It is. But unfortunately, we've got, I believe, literally millions and millions yeah. of single mothers out there right now, as Tom and I are speaking, that are sitting in their Section 8 living room somewhere, <laughs> bad-mouthing the father. Yeah. It's not just Section 8. Uh, yeah, no, it's not. It, it's, yeah. uh, it's a it's, lot of people in upper middle class. I mean, they've been taught. They've been taught by this daggone feminist oligarchy that, that you know, that they have been oppressed and that men have treated them terribly and it's their turn to have it all. And, you know, hell with men. 
Yeah, I didn't mean to make it sound like it's just poor people because it's yeah. certainly not. <laughs> It's it's everywhere. It really is. It really is. It's in the drinking water. You know, gynocentrism is in the drinking water, folks. Oh yes, and it's... Like drink. Stick with the scotch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer bourbon myself, but yeah, uh, either scotch. one will do in in place of uh, the feminist Kool Aid. Yeah. But goodness knows, there's there's enough of that going around. <laughs> uh, I. Asking you something else about this too, in what do you see as some of the key elements to how people break free of this? One we we named identifying abuse, yes, and resolving it. Um, that's sort of on the looking back side of this, right? And looking ahead, what do you suggest for people? to think about as they're moving through life post. I, don't know. I think a lot of it is, look, you know, a lot of it has to do with looking back because if you look at almost any kind of healing, it's, there's two components to it. One is safety. You know, in order to heal from anything, we have to have a, a certain safety. Uh, and within that safety, then we do something, which is the second part, which is tell the story. And everyone has a very, very different way to do that. You know, and, what I would suggest people do is look for your way to do that. And men are very surprising in the different ways that they find safety, you know, because everyone thinks, oh, well, you talk about it and you cry. And yeah, that is a valid form of safety and it's a valid form of telling the story, but it is nowhere near what men do. I mean, men do some fantastic things with their actions where they honor people. They honor the loss in some way or another, and it's through the honoring and the action that they tell that story. The story gets told over and over again. So really, what we're talking about here with old family stuff is first identifying, naming it, and then finding a way to create a safety, a safe place in order to tell that story in one way or another. And like I said, men have some, some great ways to do this. It could be that you're going to go volunteer uh, for children who are who are disabled. I mean, who knows what? I mean, and it's through that work, that volunteering, that you're finishing your own crap from your own childhood. You're helping those children in ways that you were never helped. And it's through that action, that movement, that you start healing that old story, you know? But it's it's this action and this honoring that helps you tell the story inside. Because a big piece of men's healing has to do with solitude and going inside. It's not yakety, 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 yak. You know, and men are shamed repeatedly for not talking about their stuff. And it's like, shut up, why don't you? Just shut up. Because men find ways to heal from inside. This is why shame is difficult. It's because men's process is usually one of more solitude. And gosh, there have been some fantastic examples of this. Christ is a great example. When he was in trouble, what would he do? He'd go into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And I don't remember Mary following in saying he needed to join a support group. (laughs) She didn't. She let him be. She let him be in that solitude because that's what he needed. He needed to be quiet for a while. He needed to not have anybody around. He wasn't going to, you know, commit suicide. He wasn't going to do anything. He was going to be quiet. Men need quiet. When they get quiet, good things happen. You know, so... I'm kind of getting off the off the thing here, but no, I don't think you are finding safety, and then telling the story within that safety, no matter what your way is, and and the men out there, look at your way to tell the story. At men have fantastic ways to do this, and I'm guaranteeing you, every man out there that's watching this right now has his own way to do this. And if you think about it, guys, you'll think about the ways that you have healed from things through honoring, an action or inaction. And don't let anybody tell you different. And of course, you know, if you want to learn more about that stuff, read my books. But that's uh, a, a shameless plug. I'll and second that no, that notion. No, <laughs> it's a great plug. Read Tom's books. I have. Yeah, there's this little teeny one called The Way Men Heal. It's only 58 pages long. And uh, I think men find it very, very helpful. So do women, actually. Because, you know, when women really understand how men heal from things, oh, my gosh, things change. She doesn't expect him to talk all the time. She doesn't expect him to process emotions in the same way she does. She doesn't get upset when he goes off and processes quietly. So 
You know, what Tom's talking about is really important, too, because there is a standard now in the mental health industry where it concerns this stuff that is, I don't know how else to put it, it's the stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) You go in and what they'll develop when they're working with somebody, treating somebody, they'll develop what's called a master treatment plan, and they'll set objectives um, and write down things like... um, Uh, that the patient or client will talk about their feelings about their father three times in group. That's the objective on the master treatment plan. And if they can get them to talk about it and shed a tear, then to the female oriented therapist, their job is done. Oh, yes. And you you get a couple of tears, the, the therapist to walk out of your individual session or your group just beaming about themselves and, and patting themselves in the back. Wonderful job I did with the job. Right. <laughs> Bob crap. cried about his father. And you know what? There's a lot of work. You know, a man may or may not need to shed tears about something. I mean, I mean, and we don't need to put him in a box that says he has to do it this way or that way. But for men, they heal through action. Yes, doing something. They do things, often with other men, often working side by side with other men or working on something themselves. But either way, they take action. This is one of the ways they process stuff and with the way they put distance between themselves and the original grief is, yeah. is through action. And I, I just look back. I recognized at the time, even though I was much younger than I am now and, and, and far less experienced at the time. And I knew then when I saw that stuff that it was just bullshit. It was just, right. it's like, man, you guys are getting paid. Let me get this right. I can get this guy to cry yeah. and, and I've earned my paycheck and that's it. That's all he did. It absolutely know the, the testosterone diminishes tears, you know, so you're not going to cry as much as your wife because your testosterone is slowing it up. And think back, guys, when you were eight years old, you could cry like the Banshee, right? You could cry about anything. I cried all the time for the daggone Redskins and Senators would lose every freaking game. I was laughing. Well, yeah, we had different ways to cope. <laughs> but then right about 12 years old, I stopped crying. You know, it's because testosterone took over. Yep. Testosterone lowers the tears down. You know, it doesn't mean you don't have the emotion. It means you don't have the tears that are paired with it. When women hear that and they hear, holy crap, he can't cry. They, they suddenly have compassion for men, you know, because they know what a release it is to be able to cry of the emotion. Men don't have that. Well, some women. Uh, <laughs> most of the female therapists I've ever known yeah. turn that fact, even hearing the relevant data on it. No, men are emotionally repressed because of masculinity and they need to cry like women. Uh, And and this is where we end up with a mental health system that views men as broken women. Uh And it's one of the most, you talk about abuse. Guys, you're not broken. You're not, you're not broken at all. You're just fine the way you are. And, um, Oh, Anyway, we're about finished. Yeah, I think we're about finished. I, I want to point out done. one thing. Stick a fork in before, it, and uh, and I'm going to put in a shameless plug myself. Both Tom and I have weekly meetings online through the same kind of format that you're seeing he and I talk right now. Um, we do that through our Patreons, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again: one dollar per video, and you can cap it at one dollar. And uh, you can get four 90-minute meetings a month uh, for a buck. It ain't about the money. It's about getting guys together in a place, not where they can cry and pass Kleenex, and and not where we would make fun of them if they did need to shed tears. Right. Right. That'd be fine. But a place where nobody's going to be telling them that – you know, they're, they're wrong. They're screwed up. They're toxic masculinity, any of this bullshit where guys can talk about the struggles they're going through with wives, girlfriends, ex-wives, girlfriends, their children, whatever. And we are in there every Saturday talking about these things. And 
I, I can't speak directly for anybody in there, but I can tell you the feedback I'm getting is that this is benefiting them greatly. Uh, so if you need a place like that, feel free to go check out Tom's Patreon. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a special this week. If you support Tom Golden on Patreon, I'll allow you to support me too. <laughs> How's that for a deal? I'll match that. <laughs> I'll match that deal. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, the support that we have on our Patreon is to, uh, or my Patreon is the uh, forum. rather than the, We do a monthly meeting, basically. But uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, forum, though. Still, a, yeah, it's, a, forum, it's a place it, to go. It's turned out to be very good. There's a lot of fascinating stuff going on there, you know, with red pill men from, I all bet. The, from Norway, from, from all, all places, Slovenia. So what you do is you go support Tom. And go to his forum, and then if you want to get together and, and chat live on a weekly basis, you come over to my Patreon. There you go. There. But we have, we have a blast, and uh, it's a lot better. You know, I set up an ear for men because the mental health industry sucks ass. Yeah. And, you know, it's a small group, but I um, feel like we're coming through with what the promise of that was supposed to be. Amen. And with that, I guess I'm done. I'm done too. And of course, men are good. Yes, they are. As are you. Bye-bye. Indeed. We'll see you then. <laughs>